it's very wonderful to be here today um, with uh, Chuck Mounts, Chief DeFi Officer from S&P Global Ratings. So today we're going to be talking about uh, trusted data, trusted ratings, um, and how we move that information reliably on-chain to decentralized finance and on-chain finance. So we have, we're here with uh, Chuck from S&P. So when we think about S&P and the name and the brand, we think about a, a very trusted um, institution, an institution that's really uh, powering and supporting the traditional finance economy, pretty integral to how the economy functions, actually. Um, so there's a lot of heritage there. But similarly, S&P are very uh, forward thinking and have already been a first mover, really, when it comes to engaging with uh, on-chain finance, tokenization, and blockchain. And so with all of that, um, Chuck, from your perspective, um, how are you seeing the relationship between traditional finance and decentralized finance um, evolve, especially within the context of trusted data? Right. So thank you, uh, Kylie. It's uh, really terrific to be here. I guess I'd hone in on the first part about like looking at an innovative future um, and charting a pathway uh, to on-chain markets. Um, a lot of credit goes to our executive team at S&P Global, so our former CEO and our current CEO, as well as the executive leadership team, to have the vision to understand um, and to start taking the steps to enable us to build the products and services that are going to be relevant in digital asset markets. And th so that has brought us here today. So as you know, we launched our first product in the rating space uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, the stablecoin stability assessment, measuring the risk of stablecoin depegging uh, from its intended one-to-one -one mark. And that has been followed by uh, many ratings that have come out in the ecosystem, uh, including, for instance, the Sky Protocol. Um, and one thing that's been interesting from my point of view is when you look at the pipeline of business that's been built over the last two years, I would say a year ago, uh, the clients that we were serving were all new clients. Uh, they were not our traditional clients, uh, and we were making inroads with a new set of clients to bring and leverage our historical expertise and data benchmarks and analytics into the on-chain uh, environment. As we sit here today, that's really started to shift. Um, and that now when we, uh, we are actively engaged with a, a wide range of not only still pot potential and new emerging clients, but also our traditional clients. And so there's been a shift from being very centric on new clients to our traditional clients coming into the mix. And so I, I see that as an evolution of, um, we see that the evolution of traditional players into an on-chain uh, world is, is well underway. Mm -hmm. I think we see a very similar trend at Chainlink as well from our perspective. Um, if you look at many of the projects that we've released into production quite recently, there is now very usually uh, players that are spanning both universes, so a traditional finance um, institution as well as a more blockchain native institution, Connexus, for example, and Ondo. UBS, for example, and DigiFT. And of course, the project that we've done together for bringing uh, stable coin stability assessments on chain, which is live in production right now on base, <laughs> um, is of course um, intended really, or we expect to be most useful for um, on uh, blockchain native protocols um, and decentralized uh, finance. And I think the involvement, or I'm sure in fact, the involvement of S&P in a project like that is so integral as well for um, ensuring that traditional finance customers feel um, safer and are more emboldened to become involved in these um, new protocols. So I think we agree that there is a convergence occurring. Um, we're seeing it from both of our perspectives. Um, but of course, when you have um, a kind of blockchain native or Web3 company and traditional finance um, institutions, there is often quite a difference in culture. Um, and a difference in experience um, and in the types of universes that they're operating in. And so how do you think we start to try to bridge that gap? And I mean, obviously, we're practically engaging in, in this from both of our perspectives. But what are the types of um, uh, practical um, things that we can do to, to, to bring these right. two ideologies together? Right. So uh, bridging the cultural gap is a huge issue, I think. Um, and one of the things we... Speaking to both sets of audience, like for us to speak to our uh, kind of traditional decision making, decision makers and processes is like, 
we need to move faster than we're used to moving, right? And so looking at how can we expedite processes, not shortcut processes, but make them more, work more efficiently to get to decisions faster is part of what the TradFi firm needs to do. The more crypto-oriented firm, it's, it's a message of like, okay, just be a little patient. Uh, we're a big traditional company. We have a lot of processes to go through. We will get there, but it probably won't move as fast as you would like or as you would hope. Um, and so just be having open communication around that, I think, is really helpful uh, to set expectations appropriately on the scope, the process, and the ultimate timetable of a deliverable. For the traditional firm, I think there's also an added aspect, which is you can have the tactical team uh, working on building a product or kind of building a go-to-market strategy or um, kind of around the, the digital asset or crypto endeavor. But you also need, I think, an internal sponsor, a more executive type ex internal sponsor to help push things along. So you need the tactical team to be aligned on the deliverable, but you also need that kind of more executive sponsorship to ensure that things move as quickly as they can. Absolutely. And I think this is something that I really noticed, um, obviously being uh, part of the project um, that we worked on together, um, that there has been an incredible capacity for S&P to really mobilize. Um, and we were talking earlier actually about like, how is that possible? So many traditional financial institutions that I've experienced, have experience of working with kind of very normally, right, have a couple of proponents or maybe multiple proponents within the institution, but then there's usually this difficulty of um, other people within the institution who struggle with the concept or don't understand it or are nervous or worried. Um, and so uh, within S&P, there's obviously something that's being done slightly differently or working slightly better because um, you have been able to move pretty fast. <laughs> so, well, thank you for that. Uh, sometimes uh, it doesn't feel like it's fast, but yes, I agree <laughs> that um, for a, a, a traditional, well-established uh, risk assessment company and benchmark provider, we have moved quickly. Um, I think that uh, probably the core component of it is education. And I know that for myself, um, I'm a TradFi guy, spent most of my uh, decades and most of my career on the bond trading floor. When I first heard of crypto and Bitcoin and Ethereum, I thought, ah, what a scam. Uh, that was my starting point. And the, the one constant factor to go from a skeptic to a believer to an advocate is education. Uh, so the more you learn, the more pathway you provide to converting someone from a skeptic to uh, an ad to a believer to an advocate. I've been on that journey, so I have. It's personal to me, um, and I think that's been helpful in helping. Um, you know, in a traditional firm, I would say most people, not all, but most people, start as skeptics, um, and you kind of bring them along through education and the demonstration of use cases to get them to their uh, what we call their aha moment. Um, and so my colleague Charles Jansen and I, who launched this team together three and a half years ago to take our firm on this journey, we are still to this day uh, working with uh, people within the firm, whether it's at the executive level or the middle management level or even the junior level, uh, to get them to their aha moment. And do you mind me asking, what was your aha moment? My aha moment was um, someone... I realized I didn't know anything about blockchain. I was going to say no enough, but actually I knew nothing. Um, and so I contacted a friend in the crypto space, like, how do I get started to understand this? And he said, I'll oh, just start with Bitcoin white paper. It's an easy read, you know, 10, 15 pages, whatever. And then we'll take it from there and learning. Literally five minutes into reading that, I put the paper down. I thought, oh, God, if this technology can do what it pretends to do. This is going to fundamentally shift how markets work. And I went to our CEO with the message, you need to focus on this right now. Uh, and from that moment, uh, all I've worked on is this. Wonderful. I, I do think it's super important that um, institutions that are the bedrock of our existing financial system pay attention to this, of course. Um, and so you, you, would, you mentioned there how education is super important to uh, bringing together these two different universes. And I think one of the key ways to educate or a really good way to learn is to actually go through use cases. Um, by doing that, you can bring together a group of people in a room to focus on, on the application 
um, and, and what um, very physical and real thing is due to be improved on the back of that use case. And similarly, you can then work step by step on all of the different components, which is a really good way um, to, like I said, bring people together on the same journey and learn. Um, but when we're talking about use cases um, and the potential ex huge expansion of the amount of um, uh, applications for on-chain finance and use cases, which ones excite you the most? Um, again, kind of zoning in and focusing specifically on um, data and reliable data mm -hmm. and bringing that to um, the on-chain finance world, which, which yeah. ones are really enlivening for you? Okay, um, I, I think I'll set just a tiny bit of context before kind of getting to the specific uh, question, which is um, my colleague and I bring really different skill sets to the organization. So uh, Charles Jansen, my co-founder for the team, is the crypto expert, the crypto native, the technologist, really understands the, the crypto ecosystem and the players in it. I have a very long... Uh, uh, history in traditional markets and how markets function, including being a former regulator at the Fed of New York. So the two of us together are able to have conversations that marry the ecosystem and capabilities alongside market, market and market structure and needs uh, that then allows us to ideate, like coming together to ideate solutions that will solve problems for our existing clients and our, fut and our potential future clients. So that's how the magic happens. Uh, and it really takes that deeply embedded knowledge of markets alongside a deeply embedded knowledge of crypto ecosystems to create the products. Yeah. So when I look at the future, um, one of the things that excites me as a market practitioner uh, for most of my career is that uh, credit decisions, no matter how it's executed, the credit fundamental analysis and credit decisions are still at the root of whether you're going to be have a profit or loss in your transaction. So when you look at, as data comes on chain and analysis goes from kind of lagged analysis to real-time analysis, what kind of opportunities that brings for investors to price risk better and to price it in a, in a timely way. And when you marry the, the on-chain real-time data analytic capabilities with AI, analytic capabilities. I think that the future of credit risk and the pricing of credit risk is going to be super um, kind of like the next gen and will really be advantageous uh, for, for people in managing risk and um, lowering the cost of capital um, and, and enabling people to kind of manage their risk and their return portfolios in a way that hasn't been possible before. Uh, so that to me is like one of the most exciting um, developments that is, is coming. And I guess it, when we look into the future, there's, we can't really ne necessarily predict all the ways in which the way in which things are done conventionally um, are going to unfold and develop. However, if we were to attempt to do that, I and mean, if we were to attempt to look ahead, um, let's say three or five years, um, in the context of what you've just described and this complete evolution, um, or potential complete evolution in the way that we are pricing risk and credit. Um, where would you hope, if things go super well, S and P is um, right. in the future? Where are you guys positioned? What have you enabled? What is your role? Okay, so you know what I would love to see is not only us kind of replicate or you know have a similar position in crypto and online markets that we have in traditional markets I would aspire for our position to even be better mm -hmm. um, and so what we are striving to do is with a recognition that clients fit along a full spectrum from being fully off chain to being fully on chain and everything in between and what we are striving to do is take our historical expertise and data analytics and benchmarks and, and create the products and services that enable our clients, no matter where they are on that spectrum, to um, help inform their decision making, to help provide liquidity in markets, and to enhance price discovery. So we're looking to make sure that we build the products and services um, that meet the needs of the clients no matter where they are in that spectrum of being fully off-chain to fully on-chain. And if we, can, if we can build that capability over the next several years and, and be the partner of choice for our clients, then that's a great place for us to be in three to four years. 
Wonderful. Well, I think it's really evident that you and uh, Charles and the team at SMB have been thinking about this for a while. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you and partner with you um, on the uh, Staplecoin project that we did recently um, at Chainlink Labs. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you as well, Chuck. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. It's been fantastic to be here. And we have very much uh, appreciated working with you and helping uh, really this initial stage of another uh, benchmark for us of get, bringing our information and data on chain and helping unlock the capabilities in the marketplace as a whole. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.